In March of 1918, the new Russian government, under the leadership of the legendary communist leader Vladimir Lenin, signed a peace treaty with Germany. This treaty was signed at Brest-Liftovsk in what is now modern-day Belarus. Lenin had no say in the terms of that treaty. The Germans imposed it by threatening to resume their attacks on Russia if the agreement were not to be signed immediately. This agreement brought a formal end to World War I. But under this treaty, Russia had to turn over several territories to Germany. It included Finland, Poland, Estonia, Livonia, Lithuania, Ukraine, and Bessarabia. Now, in addition, the Bolsheviks also had to give much of the southern part of Russia to the Ottoman Empire controlled by Turkey. Now, in all, the treaty forced Russia to give up about 30% of its territory, including modern-day Ukraine. Today, a hundred years later, as Vladimir Putin wages a special military operation to retrieve some of that lost Russian territory, this question confronts his Ukrainian counterpart. On Crux Decode, will Ukraine have to give up territory in order to put an end to this war? How long can Ukraine continue fighting against a bigger enemy which is showing no signs of giving up? Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky recently said the Russian forces currently occupy about a fifth of his country. Before the war began, Ukraine was the largest country in Europe by size. Today, it's about a fifth smaller. Will Ukraine have to give up territory to reach some form of ceasefire with Russia? It's been over 100 days now since this war began. Russian President Vladimir Putin's objectives are still uncertain and murky. U.S. President Joe Biden has claimed back in February that Putin was attempting to re-establish the former Soviet Union. What Putin wanted was to seize some of the territory that Moscow used to rule once upon a time. Biden has off late been signaling that Ukraine should be open to giving up land to placate Putin. And that is the only way this war can end. Now, this was a sentiment that was echoed by former Secretary of State, the legendary Henry Kissinger. But it's unclear if Ukraine would actually agree to be carved up. The territorial integrity of Ukraine should be guaranteed. That's what Zelensky said back in March as the Ukrainian troops fought off the Russian attempt to seize the capital, Kiev. He went on to say, and I quote, that is, the conditions must be fair for the Ukrainian people will not accept them otherwise. In an interview this week, Zelensky doubled down by saying, we are not ready to concede any of our territories because our territories are our territories. It is our independence, our sovereignty. That is the issue. Now, one can understand Zelensky's predicament. After becoming a valiant hero leading a smaller country against a much bigger adversary, he cannot be seen as settling for an anticlimax. He wants to end this war as a hero, not a compromised one. If it's all about ultimatums and you have to concede a third or a fifth of your country, that is not something that is palatable to the new Zelensky or even the new Ukraine. Although Joe Biden has poured billions of dollars of American military aid into Ukraine, he's often been at odds with both Zelensky and his government. But that is having the opposite effect in Ukraine. In the face of the barbaric Russian assault, the Ukrainian position on the negotiations have actually hardened and not softened. Now, many officials are arguing that Russia would have to withdraw to its pre-February 2014, that is the pre-Crimea annexation position. That is, Ukraine will not settle for the pre-February 2022 de facto border from where Russia launched this current attack. Is this Ukraine's ultimate demand or is this some kind of a negotiating tactic? Either way, it's prompted a rush of Western concern. French President Emmanuel Macron cautioned Kiev that we must not be seen as humiliating Russia. While US President Joe Biden and other NATO leaders have repeatedly said that they will not impose negotiating terms on Ukraine, but Biden felt the need to insist on a negotiated end to the conflict, hinting clearly that the American preference would be to a compromise. Biden has also got a domestic problem at hand. The U.S. electorate is concerned much more about rising inflation at home. 
gas prices and of course the latest issue gun control. Biden has seemingly not delivered on any of these issues. The American public doesn't seem to have the same attention for Ukraine as they did three months ago when this war began. And Biden knows this because this could potentially mean that his party, the Democrats, could lose their House majority in the upcoming midterm elections. If the Republicans were to take control of Congress in the November elections, then America's leadership of the global response to Russia's aggression would be challenged. Reports from Moscow suggest Putin is banking on exactly that. In other words, Putin may feel that time is on his side, and he could be right as an ugly battlefield stalemate continues week after week and month after month, hundreds of Russian and Ukrainian soldiers dying every single day, millions displaced from their homes, and neither army able to overwhelm the other. Much may yet depend on three basic factors. Number one, whether Ukraine can sustain the fight, that is whole ground, inflict losses on the Russians, and maintain morale among its own forces. When the answer hinges on a continuing flow of Western arms and diplomatic support. And whether that support continues depends on the willingness of Western electorates to live with the side effects of this war. So that would mean higher inflation, shortages of electricity, wheat, uh, and of course, other basic products. Already, this war is being squeezed off the front pages by domestic issues in America, for example, gun control, abortion, and like I said, gas prices. Continuing support for Ukraine may soon erode. The second issue, of course, is military. Although Ukrainian forces have so far prevailed in the northern part of the country, including, of course, defending the capital, Kiev, they are clearly struggling to maintain their position in the Donbass. Whether this shattered country can continue to blunt relentless Russian attacks, that is still open to question. Ukraine's population is less than one-third the size of Russia's. Its economy is one-ninth the size of Russia's. So far, Ukraine has performed brilliantly against heavy odds. Possibly a combination of mounting casualties, stunning depletions in its military equipment, and of course, dreadful morale problems may cause the Russian offensive to stall and lose ground. But the question remains, for how much longer can Ukraine continue to hold off a desperate Russia. Vladimir Putin does not appear to be the kind of leader who is stealthily trying to move towards a deal with Ukraine. He would rather think that Russia can fight for as long as it takes to achieve its ends. The third and final issue concerns the impact of the war and the impact of Western sanctions on the Russian people. Whether Western economic sanctions can do enough damage to the Russian economy to force Putin to readjust his aims. Now, history gives scant cause for optimism because economic sanctions have rarely, if ever, caused nations to abandon what they view as vital national security objectives.